Hello everyone, and very, you're very welcome to today's event. I'm Anne Grant, and I'm lecturer in astrobiology education with Astrobiology OU, a research group based at the Uni Open University in the UK. Astrobiology OU is an interdisciplinary group of around 50 researchers, scholars, and practitioners. We come from a wide range of interests, science, philosophy, law, governance, engagement, education, international development, and more. And together we are trying to address the scientific governance and ethical challenges faced by astrobiology and related exploration missions. A challenge that takes us beyond and between disciplinary borders. If you'd like to find out more about astrobiology, equity and engaged research, you'll find resources and links posted in the chat box during the presentations, which you can follow up. Today's event is the second in a short series of events called the Borders of Astrobiology in which we're hoping to explore the regions at the edges and at the intersections of experience, expertise and disciplinary borders. This event will consider issues of ethical engagement and knowledge production in astrobiology and space exploration, such as how we can facilitate increased engagement in space activities, especially in developing and emerging countries and among marginalised groups, how we can explore and challenge structural inequalities and power hierarchies, and how we can achieve fair co-production, and not least what fairness and inclusion even mean in this context. So let me introduce the people who will be stimulating today's discussions. Our keynote speaker is Timiebi Aganaba. Timiebi is Assistant Professor of Space and Society in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University in the USA. I have to say I was really totally delighted when Timmy Aby agreed to speak at today's event, because in so many ways she personalizes the stretching of the disciplinary and expertise boundaries where law, governance, engagement and ethics come together. As well as distinguished legal scholar, she's worked in the space industry and in space policy with the Nigerian government. Timmy Aby will speak for about 25 minutes and that will be followed by responses from three panelists. Emily Dawson is Associate Professor in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at University College London. Her work explores the relationship of science and society through the lenses of equity and social justice. Richard Holliman, Rick Holliman, is Professor of Engaged Research at the Open University. His work explores the concept of engaged research an approach to co-constructing knowledge through stakeholder communities who work together in meaningful ways. A principle which is at the heart of the work of Astrobiology OU. And finally, Andrea Berardi is a senior lecturer in environmental information systems at the Open University. He has pioneered the development and application of community owned solutions, practices that are conceived, developed and successfully implemented within communities, by communities, to meet complex challenges facing those communities. After the keynote and responses, there will be time for discussion. And I'd encourage you all to make use of the Q&A box that you'll find down the bottom of your screen during the presentation and responses to share your questions, comments, thoughts, and opinions, which we'll then discuss between the panelists. So once again, thank you all for joining us. And I'm now going to hand over to Timmy Aby to start our conversation. Thank you so much, Anne. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm trying to think of all the languages I can think of and I can only think of English, which is terrible. But to say welcome and thank you all for this wonderful opportunity um, to present. Hopefully I can do it in 25 minutes. Okay, so I'm a professor of space and society at the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, maybe even the first one. And with that title, what does that even mean? So I see science and society as a thing. In fact, Google says so, right? Um, Dr. Alondra Nelson, for instance, in the US is the Deputy Director of Science and Society at the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. And during a 16th of January, 2021 event at which President Biden introduced his team, Nelson acknowledged the challenges ahead. Never before in living memory have the connections between our scientific world and our social world been quite so stark as they are today, she said. I believe we have a responsibility to work together to make sure that our science and technology reflects us. 
So maybe I am the Alondra Nelson for space, not just because we are both black females, but because I am in the business of looking at human social behavior, patterns of social relationships, social interaction and culture that surrounds our interaction with space exploration and use. And I do this through the lens of law, governance, policy and ethics. You've seen the abstract before of this talk, you don't have to read it, but my colleagues in the picture are who I've worked on this presentation with, so thanks to them. So space, it seems, has a version control problem. The European Space Agency have adopted the term space 4.0 to describe the current era of space flight. Intended to parallel industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, another term common in Europe, it represents the current era of emerging commercial as well as international partners. For the record, Space 1.0 is the early study of astronomy, Space 2.0, the initial space age and the race to the moon, Space 3.0, the international corporation exemplified by the International Space Station, and Space 4.0, a time when space is evolving from being the preserve of governments of a few spacefaring nations, to a situation in which there is an increased number of diverse space actors around the world, including the emergence of private companies, participation with academia, industry and citizens, digitalization and global interaction. For some, the characterization is historically inaccurate, but a great soundbite. As Chris Lee says, it ignores the rise of satellites as a force for good and commerce throughout the 70s and 80s, and weds us to the further inaccuracies that link satellites to space exploration to human spaceflight. These are all different facets of space, but with very different roles, goals, and capacity to deliver. Therefore, especially in the US, others have simply divided the eras into space 1.0 and today's new space era as 2.0. Either way, it appears that with the advent of everyday individuals going to space as a top apotomized by the Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin flights in July, 2021, and SpaceX Inspiration4 mission shortly after, we are entering the new era where individuals and people matter. Danny, Danny Bedner has coined it the 5.0 ethics era. This is indeed the future I was referring to in my 2019 TEDx talk, the future of the space 4.0 era. Being a space advocate in the space 4.0 era has engendered mixed feelings of both excitement and worry. Is our space future going to be one marked by promise and progress or more of the same injustices we have seen in the past as scientists and innovators pay little attention to social concerns? A new breed of advocates are calling for change, which marks the space 5.0 era. So Danny Bedner indeed said it best. With the expansion of space activities comes plurality and diversity of experiences at levels never seen before in the community of previously nationalistic focused, generationally selfish space interested actors that dominated the 20th century. Space 5.0 is distinguishable as a new era of explicit diversity of experience and ethical considerations in relation to processes taking place in or related to outer space. It has meant the discursive maturation of space from a monolithic concept of most space activities being equal to the more explicit characterization of kinds of space activities reflective of a more advanced network of political, social, historical, and cultural relations between actors. In my TEDx talk, if you watched it, I ended with my favorite quote from Jerry Esrich and Ed Finn. They say, space is not a void, but a canvas for the human imagination. Questions of policy and logistics are merely scaffolding for a deeper set of questions about who we are and who we want to be as a species. We explore the universe, not just because we are curious, but because of what that curiosity will do to us and how we will grow to match our expanding sphere of influence and understanding. The thesis that I put forth is that what goes on on earth and in space, the similarities and differences and connections between the domains is a complex systems problem. My first question therefore is, is a canvas the right metaphor or is the space endeavor actually a mirror? In each case, what you see is a reflection of who you are as the creator to either paint the canvas or who you are as reflected as a mirror. For many space enthusiasts, they look at space as a blank slate to reinvent humanity. But what I am asking is how do the discussions about space actually reflect what goes on on earth legally, socially? It could be a mirror of what goes on here. But because the history of man's use of space is short, 
it is less complex. There are limited past dependencies. And so we can actually try to reimagine the future. If I take space exploration as a mirror, it's important to ask how we got to the space endeavor. What was your journey and what drives your thinking and the narratives you have about space? So how did I get here? Scientists and many others don't like the use of the word I, the focus on the self. It screams subjectivity. It is not scalable or replicable. Yet Judith Butler says that we must take account of oneself. The sense of having a self or selfhood should, however, not be confused with subjectivity itself. So in taking an account of oneself, I start with me as a professor of space and society at the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. I had no idea what that meant. Was I supposed to be able to predict the future? Three years in, what I've come to realize is that I'm not in the game of predicting the future, but I double down when I see the future is already here. And I am inspired by Afrofuturism and African futurism, basically science fiction that centers African perspectives and stories. Sun Ra on the left is Afrofuturism. This use of music and art to imagine that space is the place is interesting, but African fu futurism on the right is actually here in the form of increased African participation in space. So according to Space in Africa, the consultancy in its African Space Industry Annual Report 2020 edition, as of July 2020, 11 countries have launched satellites and 19 African countries established or began the process of creating a space program to take advantage of space applications. For 2020, African governments budgeted an estimated $490 million towards their space program compared to $250 million from the previous year, excluding capital expenditures on the acquisition of satellites. In total, Africa has spent approximately $4.5 billion towards the launch of 43 satellites. And almost half of those satellites were launched within the last four years, indicating a surge of interest on space in the continent. Now, with all this increased activity from developing countries, it forces us to question assumptions about who we see in the future, especially when we have progress underpinning these paradigms. But the future that I alluded to in my 2019 TEDx talk on the future of the Space 4.0 era is indeed emerging in what Danny Bednar has coined the ethics era 5.0. And according to him, what has been less discussed in the conception of these eras if they are indeed meaningful labels we wish to accept, is the ramification of such expansion of space activities and inclusion of actors with broader values. So what you see in this slide is in the yellow basically looks at, you know, what were the concerns of marginalized actors which were ignored in the different eras. So for instance, the, the Apollo era 2.0, collective rights was really a concern around that era. Um, in the space 3.0 era, the space benefits declaration was negotiated where developing countries basically tried to get a legal regime to ensure that benefits would be shared, but their concerns were largely ignored, I would say. And in the space 5.0 era where diversity and inclusion is important, we see that we no longer can ignore ethics and equity. So herein lies the idea of the space 5.0 era. From my lens of law and governance and from my observations of social movements, I see that the space 5.0 era is marked by social transformation and three broad trends, which have law, governance, and ethics at the center. First, resisting the structures of coloniality. This is not just about inclusion and opening the door a little bit, but shattering the narratives and foundations of space exploration, its why, and the place of different stakeholders. Concurrently, as the future is for all, the approach needs to be centered on a thought out cosmopolitanism that recognizes common and differentiated obligations and benefits for humanity. Secondly, a move towards operationalizing equity. But how do we think about this practically? We must look at the concept of fairness in international law and bring sociology into the law. This calls for a focus on justice and interpretation, which is beyond the law. Thirdly, application of principles of general areas of terrestrial law to the space domain. For example, what is the place of individuals and human rights as we start thinking seriously about space settlement? And how do we think of space as an environment that requires sustainable development, requiring the application of environmental law standards? And tangentially, if coalitions will be leading exploration, then what are the applicable principles of polycentric governance that apply? 
So as the US-led Artemis Accords may need to be applied alongside a Chinese-Russian-led governance system, how do we interact between legal orders? Could there even be a non-aligned movement too made up of non-state actors focused on the organizing and governing themselves through transactions, contract, and private law principles? But central to understanding these trends is an understanding of social transformation looked at from the lens of philosophy and legal theory. Back in 2010, McGill Law Professor Richard Janda asked us in a class, what is the relationship between social transformation and the law? The first thing I thought was that there is a debate as to whether legal change follows social transformation or vice versa, and whether law is an active or passive force for change. At that time, it was clear to me that the task of social transformation, whether through the law or any other medium, had become more difficult today. And I argued that it's because the system has very successfully conditioned society. Roberto Unger's text is very relevant today because it seeks to question how can we move forward in today's apathetic world while theories of the past have sought to propose diametrically opposed systems or offered radical ideas for how society should be organized and governed. And looking at the work of other noted philosophers, a few points struck out to me. There's a need to understand our past, our influences, and the symbols and behaviors we are conditioned to understand and respond to. Foucault touched upon discipline and how society can be conditioned without even knowing it. The understanding of the far-reaching and frightening prospect of this is fundamental to the goal of social transformation because it highlights how all concepts or ideas for social transformation can be used in the negative sense to either maintain the status quo or create change for the worst, depending on who is looking for the change. There are many other insights that I gained from my study at McGill University, a modern transistemic teaching institution, but probably the central contribution to my understanding of social transformation comes from Duncan Kennedy, whose thesis is that the main barrier to social transformation is the rarefication and fetishization of the law within society. My understanding of his argument is that the pretense that law is determinate mystifies social life, encouraging people to think that the practices codified in law have fixed and frozen what they can hope to achieve, and that so long as their rights are protected, they can't complain, thus discouraging them from political action aimed at transforming the content of rights so as to realize the emancipatory potential of law. In this sense, society itself can use the law to change the law and transform society, but the law can also be used to trap society into thinking that it cannot be changed. Bearing that in mind, what are the main features of 5.0? So Natalie Trevino's work is what I refer to here when we talk about resisting the structures of coloniality. She argues that the decolonization of the American narrative of space exploration represents a new path and creates the conditions for a cosmic revolution where awe and hope manifest a multitude of epistemologies and humanities. Space will not become a frontier or a place to be conquered, but rather an already existing and integral part of the ecological system, space and humanity's foundation for a new world cosmic order, where imagination and reality are not limited to exploitation and bloom with the possibilities of the universe. As space exploration is a haven for the imagination, we must recognize it as the same for hege hegemony. Space that is conceptualized today in North America cannot be removed from its relationship to American Western expansion. But more than just a metaphoric and narrative connection, these two places are linked by a variety of social, political, and cultural structures as conceptualized through the colonial matrix of power. So clearly the frontier metaphor inspires both rhetoric and visions of the future, but she argues that this is where the danger lies. The references to the frontier metaphor in space exploration, policy, imagination, and public discourse indicates relationships to larger contexts and systems of coloniality, capitalism, racism, and patriarchy. In fact, neutral in the space commu community is often hegemonically Western and patriarchal. So a post-colonial critique of space exploration is limited to interactions between living beings whereas decolonial critiques tend to examine the logic behind relations. Yet, as so many are quick to say, there are no Indians in space, as though colonization only had one form and one effect. Those of us in the West are the most colonized because our minds are clouded by imperial dreams masters innocent exploration. 
In fact, this is the first myth that Chris Van Eyck refers to as the three myths of space governance, that there are no direct victims, there is no relevant history, and no applicable law for space exploration and exploitation. Chris talks a lot about generalizing space law, which leads me to the second bubble on the left. The constitution of outer space is the Outer Space Treaty. Article three of the Outer Space Treaty applies in space, but activities must be carried out by international law applicable to the domain of space. You can't just copy and paste terrestrial law because of the unique characteristics, but there are other areas of international law that are relevant. The difficult question is how relevant and how adaptable to fill and provide additional legal coverage for those activities. So Chris argues that generalist international law should be on the table. If general international laws lawyers leave space as a legal vacuum, others will fill it instead. Already, our abdication has enabled billionaires and militarists to take the reins of space discourse and perpetuate the myth that its law is inconvenient and obsolete. The myth of space as a legal vacuum is as old as space law itself, but it does make sense to use the rules we've got at home. From there, any new rules must build atop that history and not erase it. Unfortunately, in our absence, the myth of lawlessness has prevailed, creating a space orientated not towards the rights of states or people, but to limitless capitalism and the extractive futures it imagines. The scrambles for the skies has raged quietly for years, high above our ground fixed gazes. But law happens with or without its lawyers. And if international law doesn't aim higher soon, the skies will indeed become our limit. Despite the importance of understanding the place of law, polycentric governance may be the way that we go for now. A polycentric system comprises multiple governing authorities at different scales, which do not stand in hierarchical relationship to each other, but are engaged in self-organization and mutual adjustment. Here, the first example is the United States-led Artemis Accords, the proposed future Russian-Chinese agreement, and Brian Israel's Space 3.0 private law scenario. It is contended, and we can go to, if you don't know the Artemis Accords, we can talk about it in the questions, but it is contended that the benefit of the Artemis Accords is that they are flexible and can respond quickly to change, unlike the treaty regime. However, others have argued that it is odd to see NASA attempting to define proper behavior in space on its own, and that NASA's actions as a diplomatic surrogate for the United Nations is a significant and potentially harmful milestone in the commercialization of outer space. China and Russia are particularly notable absence from the Artemis Accords, and other notable absences such as Germany, France, and India are unsure of the merits of joining. While China has been largely silent, Russia has declared that the Artemis Accords are too US centric, despite its discussions with the United States about participation in the orbital outpost of the Artemis program. So declared as a response to the US Artemis program in March, 2021, Russia and China announced a preliminary agreement to jointly develop a research facility known as the International Lunar Research Station. Statements from Roscosmos and CNSA underline that the project will be open to all interested countries and international partners. According to media reports, Chinese and Russian space officials said that they were already in negotiations with international partners, including the European Space Agency, Thailand, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia to join their endeavor. As many states, including Germany, France, and India, have hesitated becoming signatories to the Artemis Accords, China and Russia are arguably leveraging this hesitancy to bring these states and others into cooperative agreements, which commentators argue would challenge future legal structures and endorse based on the Artemis Accords. Namrata Goswami has asked us to think strategically, though, about the benefits of a China-Russia lunar development plan with, say, Alliance Across Its Belt and Road Initiative, which has 131 members now, access to launch sites, ground stations, and receiver stations, access to a universal talent pool, creating new markets and a space ecosystem for them and their partners, and sharing in the costs of research and development. All these benefits coming from competitive alignments. Would the Artemis Accords like governance regime be developed as an alternative? The result is that diversity in that there would be a gradual emergence of numerous decision-making centers producing numerous partially overlapping issue-specific regimes. 
This is what we say creates a polycentric governance, a regime complex and a fragmentation scenario as articulated by Tepper. He and others argue that space governance is and should be moving towards polycentrism. Nevertheless, the appeal of using polycentric thinking is hampered by the lack of clear principles for how to operationalize it. There are several examples of various attempts at cross-scale collaboration, but very few analysis assessing their impact on governance. What seems clear though, is that it's likely that all governance regimes that will be established will declare to have as their foundation, the Outer Space Treaty. We should of course also watch for the non-aligned transactional approach as proposed by Brian Israel. He talks of Space Law 3.0, which he argues will be a private law system of contracts between operators. The smart contract functionality of blockchain networks such as Ethereum introduce new possibilities for private ordering in the space domain and may be particularly enabling of a space resources economy. He argues native digital smart contracts remove friction and contractual hazards from a chain of transactions ex executed by machines far from earth, where there is little sense in importing such terrestrial baggage as negotiating with countries, laws, courts, and language which govern contracts. He says code is universal and smart contract enforcement is automatic and that if a critical mass of operators store value on interoperable blockchain networks, it is even theoretically possible to have a private contractual regime for allocating and enforcing quasi property interests in space resources in which infringement triggers an automatic transfer of value. Interesting. And finally, the third bubble, how do we operationalize equity? All these thoughts could come down to a better understanding of fairness in international law that considers social change to operationalize the equity we always talk about. The legitimacy and fairness of international law, however, will be judged first by the degree to which the rules satisfy participants' expectations of justifiable distribution of costs and benefits, and secondly, by the extent to which the rules are made and applied in accordance with what the participants perceive as rights process. It is required, therefore, to identify the core of a shared assumptions about fairness, or more exactly unfairness, which once identified and agreed upon will enable the community to embark on the fairness discourse and to proceed with negotiations which address specific allocation problems. As other legal disciplines and non-space disciplines start finding their way to space discourse, and space starts mainstreaming, maybe we'll be able to find, come up with a better concept of fairness, bringing in human rights principles, environmental law standards to seize the space environment as something of value. Alessandro Marino of the Open University makes us think more about what equity in research, particularly in analog sites looks like. So the space 5.0 era causes us to reflect on our roles. This reflection opens the door to wondering what is the purpose of ethics in relation to the subject? Is ethics a means to violently exclude those who be don't belong to the field of its rigidifying universality? Or is it rather a method to question this very universality? In other words, should ethics offer a reflection on how to live and act within a social fear made up of cultural or legal norms? Or should it enable the subject to question these very norms? So the question, how do these insights address the question of today, which we'll get into in the discussion of how can we facilitate increased engagement in space activities? How can we explore and challenge structural inequalities and power hierarchies? And what does fairness and inclusion mean? These are very difficult questions to answer. But I think the first thing that we have to do to answer this is to encourage active dialogue and listening without paying lip service to the findings. We may not like what we hear, but space is an opportunity for reimagination. And then after listening, we need to effectively facilitate cooperation and collaboration on equitable terms, which Alessandra's work helps us think about. And of course, ethics and governance are key issues to help with this. So I think at that, I see this is 25 minutes on the dot. So how have I done, Anne? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. I mean, you, you, you posed some difficult questions at the end. But, you know, you gave us such a lot of food for thought through the, 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 the challenges you raised as you were speaking. And uh, 
just thank you. And that I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone when I say that. Well, I, what we're going to do now is we're going to invite some responses to, to me, the questions Timmy Aby has posed. So yeah, just some short responses from, panel, from our three panelists who reflect different perspectives on questions of equity and engagement. And I'm going to ask Emily to start, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, well, um, thanks for inviting me to respond to this. And Timmy Aby, I'm sure as you've all realized, has just said a lot of really interesting things. So I'm going to try and respond from my perspective, which is looking at science and society relationships, but I'm really interested in the space of popular culture and how we understand how people encounter science in their everyday ordinary lives. Um, so from this kind of perspective, space is a huge theme if we turn to look at science and popular culture. And it's present in so many facets of popular culture that it's really hard to ignore. And what I'd like to draw out today are how structural inequalities intertwine with space, science and popular culture. And they mobilize particular imaginaries about science and society relationships. And I want to talk that through, but at the end, offer some ideas for disruption and uh, to use Tim Yobi's words, this idea then of social transformation. That science and society are mutually constitutive is a really central tenet of science and technology studies. And popular science, I would argue, is a really key part of that landscape, with television still the main source of scientific information for people in the UK, with social media a close second in front of print media. But within that landscape, we know remarkably little about how race and ethnicity, gender, social class, ability, sexuality, and the other intersecting social positions that shape people's lives are co-produced through popular culture and how they in turn mediate science and society relationships. So of course, many, many people have written about how science fiction is a way to understand contemporary societies. And space isn't only present in popular culture in the form of science fiction, but as you will see, it's one of the big places that we see space. So many of those people are canon published sci-fi writers. And we have this idea of the, the idea that science fiction is a, a future history of the present, which is a really nice turn of phrase. So whether you read N.K. Jemison writing about the unbearable whiteness of the kids cartoon, The Jetsons, or Nnedi Okorafor writing about her focus on challenging mainstream representational practices in her Binti series, or if you read Ursula Le Guin's later writings about how she understands gender performativity and the subsequent analyses that other people had done on gender in her book, The Left Hand of Darkness, space is at once ever present. And for most of us, a sort of a very fictive, unattainable impossibility for all that it is a possibility that is repeatedly imagined, inscribed and re-inscribed through popular culture practices. So, here is a slide that is not about sci-fi before I really go into sci-fi stuff. So I would argue that popular culture is a really important site for thinking about space and science precisely because of its ubiquity. In my research with adult community groups from minoritized backgrounds in London, no one had visited what I would call the orthodox high culture platforms of science where they might encounter space. So places like planetaria, science museums, science centers, university outreach activities, science festivals. But everyone, as I'm sure you can imagine, looked at the stars, thinks about the stars and understands stars as something in their lives. So whether we talk about Connie, an elderly Afro-Caribbean woman who told stories and legends about the stars, or whether you think about Thomas, a younger Sierra Leonean man, talking passionately about how he loved to watch the sky at night, which is what this is a slide of, which is a BBC Four factual programme about astronomy. Um, and Thomas talks about wanting, loving watching this when he comes back from a night out. But because space was and still is such a big theme in popular culture, and popular culture was a key site for the people who worked with me to encounter science and engage with science, those encounters shaped their relationship to science and to space. And they engaged with factual and fict fictitious imaginaries. And as I'm sure you're all too aware or can at least guess, those shaping effects were not positive ones for the people who worked with me. Space was understood as no more for them 
than a contemporary career as an academic physicist or an opera singer, and being a famous footballer seemed more realistic. So I want to turn back to science fiction and this co-construction with society and, and ideas about science. Constance Penley's path-breaking book, NASA Trek, and Andre Carrington's equally path-breaking rejoinder years later, Speculative Blackness, The Future of Race and Science Fiction, they explore at length how in real life work of space science and the fictive universes dreamed up through stories about space in popular culture are co-constructed and follow dominant social narratives about who and what matters. So while, as you can see in this slide, the cast of the original series of Star Trek were on the books and paid by the American Space Program and NASA um, to advertise that space program, Penley shows how despite the repeated extensive and public failures of NASA, Star Trek worked to secure the value of NASA and an American space program in American hearts and minds. Star Trek thereby produced a, a public imaginary that investing in space exploration was worthwhile and to some extent inevitable. Which is not to say there weren't problems with this particular modality of science and society relationships, since at the same time in the same country, Gil Scott Heron was singing his criticisms of Whitey on the Moon. What Penley goes on to show is how punitive those dreams about space were for the women involved in the real space program and in those fictive visions of the future. And Carrington, in turn, while decrying Penley's focus on gender as too limited, moved his focus to questions of race and ethnicity, and like Penley, describes how across multiple formats, from comics and books to TV programs, and this is, I think, a really useful current um, example that we see at the moment, the Watchmen series, um, how, and so looking at his data then, it was about structural inequalities and his data on ethnicity and race, and these are projected into imagined space futures. So not to mention they're in, as Timmy Avey has, the ever present themes of settler colonialism with countless colonizable planetary systems whose wealth, whether cultural or material or otherwise might be extracted and endless sci-fi genocides with the content, the constant creation of these fictitious killable populations, a practice that we see particularly brought home in contemporary gaming. Similarly, Lindy Orthea's body of work about the UK TV programme Doctor Who also echoes these themes, but from a more intersectional perspective. Her work shows that time and time again, white, male, upper class, cis, hetero body people, stories and values permeate this long running popular kids TV show about space and aliens, complete again with the colonial potential and the killable alien populations. So I want to ask what we can learn if we start to put these ideas and data sets together. Space fictions in popular culture represent this huge site for how people see themselves or not in relation to space and to science. The imaginary narratives, casting, naming, symbolism, and really all the representational practices of space as a fictive construct in popular culture reproduce structural inequalities and are in turn produced by them. These space fictions then can be understood as doing a kind of work in a sociological sense. Science and popular culture, and in this case, stories about space, is mutually constitutive of society. That is, these are not separate things. These fictions are embedded in our sociocultural politics. And indeed, we might ask, how could they not be? Reproducing one another while being reproduced together. But if we remember our Foucault and our Stuart Hall, if power can be dispersed, so can resistance. And I want to suggest that we can use these ideas about space fictions and the work they do to reimagine science and society relationships in ways that I think are potentially disruptive and transformational. And to do that, I want to talk about fan fiction and slash, slash fiction. So the image on your screens now is from Diane Merchant's 1975 text, which was titled A Fragment Out of Time which seems to be the first published, albeit published underground, Kirk Spock slash fiction. What the scholars I've mentioned today, um, what their work does for how we might usefully reimagine space and society relationships is they turn their focus later in their research to the non-dominant forms of popular culture. So to underground subcultural and alternative forms of popular culture, specifically the work of fan fiction, 
Whether it takes the form of relatively vanilla reworked narratives of popular science fiction, where favorite characters are shipped, that is they're put in relationships, contra to the canon, or the more sexually explicit world of slash fiction, this work shows the power of these everyday ordinary fan practices to subvert, reimagine and reconstruct micro and macro relationships and economies between science and society. So we see in this kind of work that, of course, as I'm sure we can all expect, racialized minorities can and do exist in space, in these spaces. And so can everyone else who has had to look to the margins to find themselves represented in space and science fiction. What's more, they can be protagonists as well as every other kind of character you can imagine. And as is well researched in slash fiction, these stories can subvert, for instance, white cis hetero patriarchal stories about society, space and science. So while in one way it may not seem hugely unusual, because there is just so much fan fiction out there. So in explaining what I was doing later today to a friend this morning, I got really lost for a long time just trying to send her a GIF on WhatsApp because there are so many Kirk slash Spock gifts out there that you can send on a mainstream platform like WhatsApp. In the context of the canon of the stories we set, we tell repeatedly about science and society and space, these are still hugely subversive, radical transformations of established and arguably outdated narratives. So I want to end by asking what else might we learn from looking away from dominant cultural modalities of science and society relationships? What about forms of citizen science that are not institutionally framed? What about the producage practices that we see on social media? What about the less obvious forms of activism? What if we were to start from the idea that everybody, regardless of who or where they are, is in a science and society relationship? whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, agentic, positive, apathetic, or otherwise? What if we then reimagine science and society relationships as practices and knowledges rooted in the everyday, ordinary experiences of people around the world, in practices, that is to say, that already exist, rather than ones that have to be reinvented to mediate a supposed divide? What if we made space to recognize then all the fan fiction, the gamer mods, the trans teenagers supporting one another on YouTube with information about hormonal medications. Now, of course, we can neither romanticize nor blindly judge such activities. Not all alternative formulations will be emancipatory, nor will they all be equally oppressive. Rather, I think it is important that we recognize them as part of a landscape from which broader, more inclusive understandings of science and society relationships can emerge. This broadening itself, I would argue, is really helpful. The project of reimagining science and society relationships through decentering the dominant, orthodox, most visible and most valued narratives about space or science is thus as likely to return as many dysfunctional alternatives and dystopias. And I'm thinking here of the rape mods in Witcher games, the popular misogyny of Gamergate um, and certain forms of environmental activism as it does functional alternatives and utopias. And I'm thinking here about trans positive fan fiction, grassroots citizen science projects, and again, certain forms of environmental activism. And that these um, may also happen within the same project. So by pulling into focus the ordinary everyday ways that people engage with space and thereby with science, I think that will help us to disrupt these established narratives about space, science and society and that in itself usefully disrupts how we can understand science and society relationships and opens up, I would argue, new possibilities for transformation. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thanks ever so much. Uh, I'm going to ask Rick to, sp to speak next, if that would be OK. So, yeah, I, I thought both uh, the first two talks were absolutely fabulous. Thank you for those. I mean, and uh, there's a, some echoes uh, in what I'm going to say here. Uh, trying to pick up on, particularly on the kind of practicalities. Uh, so Timmy Avey talked about how do we operationalize equity? Uh, and I'm particularly interested in that in the context uh, of engagement and how we do that and who's involved in it. Um, and in that sense, it kind of picks up on some of the things that Emily was talking about as well in terms of that kind of non-dominant uh, narrative, the non-dominant actors who haven't had a voice uh, and how do we enable those? 
So yeah, so I'm very much talking about this in the context of how we explore what uh, fairness and inclusion could and should mean in the context of engagement uh, and how we can avoid some of the injustices uh, that resulted in disempowerment and suffering in the past. So the two concepts, I argue inclusion and fairness are obviously related. And for the purposes uh, of my contribution to this panel, I'll consider them together first uh, and make the argument that engagement, if considered sensitively uh, and with the principles of inclusion in mind, has the potential to reduce epistemic injustice. Uh, and here I'm drawing on the work of Miranda Fricker and promote fairness in knowing. Uh, and here I'm drawing on the work of Fabian Medvedi. So I note here that colleagues and I, including Alessandra Marino, who uh, chaired the excellent webinar last week uh, in this series, uh, chair today, Anne Grand, uh, and panelists who's gonna come after me, Andrea, uh, have a paper under review that explores in much more detail the issues that I'll rehearse today. So my core argument, or our core argument, is that if we plan upstream uh, for engagement in ways that are more democratic and collaborative, uh, there is the potential to flip uh, Fricker's conceptualization of epistemic injustice and offer more inclusive and fair practices that promote epistemic justice and fairness in knowing in how we engage. So Fricker introduces two underpinning concepts in her 2007 book on epistemic justice, power ethics and uh, power and the ethics of knowing that I argue have relevance to uh, what we're discussing today, inclusion, fairness and engagement. And those two concepts are uh, testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice. Um, and interestingly, in the concept of what's gone before, one of the things we've left focus on next so far is who has a voice. Yeah, we focused a lot about what they talk about, but less about who has a voice. And, and I think that has real relevance to, to the issues we're talking about today. So in that context, uh, Fricker talks about testimony and justice in the context of credibility excess and credibility deficit. Uh, credibility excess, you won't be too surprised to, uh, to know this guy says what it says on the tin. Uh, so who dominates the narrative and credibility deficit, uh, who does not? And my argument is, is if we apply these concepts to upstream planning for engagement, uh, my proposition is they offer opportunities to think seriously about questions of representation. So that requires us to do some analysis on who's had a voice in these debates in the past and who hasn't. Who currently has a voice in questions, therefore, about astrobiology research and innovation? Who has consistently spoken to these issues in the past? And how often are these voices heard in relation to other voices? And then crucially, obviously, who is routinely excluded and why? So there's, there's a real focus there on people. Who's involved in these activities? The second point uh, that uh, Fricker talks about, thermonuclear injustice, uh, and she argues this relates to who does and does not have access to shared tools of interpretation. Uh, and this just touches again on some of the issues that were raised by Timmy A.B. and Emily. So in this sense, this relates to whether and how those who are engaging have encountered issues, the issues that are under consideration, uh, which obviously in turn relates to which issues are within and without scope in relation to astrobiology and research and innovation. Put simply, do we agree the terms of reference for the engagement about a particular topic? And how do we agree, uh, agree those terms of engagement? The second point is whether and how those engaging have any prior knowledge of the processes of engagement, which in turn relates to how engagement is conceptualized in practice. Uh, and I note uh, Emily's point particularly there about rooting these things in the everyday so in experiences that people actually already understand. So crucially, that also uh, relates to whether we have a shared understanding of the rules of engagement and how we agree those rules. And then my third point is whether and how those engaging have experience or desire to be involved in the production of the outputs or products uh, of engagement, which of course then in turn relates to how different constituencies might wish to represent themselves, how, when, and to whom. In short, how do we tell the stories uh, from the engaged practices that we, uh, we do together? And then finally, my final point is whether and how those engaged in have experience of working together under equitable conditions in the past, uh, and what measures might need to be put in place to create spaces where these conditions can be negotiated and agreed. Uh, we obviously have 
historical injustices uh, in all these kind of practices that we need to take into into account. So in, in put simply, how do we agree on what is fair and inclusive um, is my point there. So put simply, I'm arguing have all the parties develop shares ways of engaging that are both meaningful and equitable. And then how could this be enabled and supported? Uh, and my argument is if we accept that Fricker's concept of epistemic justice has merit in the context of opportunity planning for engagement, those undertaking that planning can refer to a series of quite simple questions, I would argue, that will inform their planning. Uh, and those planning, uh, those questions are, are listed in short on this slide. So in seeking argue, answers to these questions, my argument is that those planning engagement from flesh out a deep, detailed plan for implementation, implementation that is inclusive and fair. So the first question uh, relates to testimonial and justice. Uh, so who are the constituencies, the publics, the stakeholders, the community groups, uh, the end users, the institutions uh, who could engage and should engage? So there's a focus here on questions of inclusion and exclusion, obviously, uh, and those playing engagement, I argue, should use inclusive stakeholder mapping techniques to explore the constituencies for engagement. So this should include some, uh, some account of historical and international dimensions, in particular paying close attention to structural and historical injustices. So there's a question about who's in the room. Yeah, and how do we ensure that that conversation starts uh, with an inclusive group of people? And the second question uh, is obviously, what are the aims and objectives of the engagement and how are these decided? So again, this comes back to the question of uh, inclusion of fairness. So who is included in deciding what we engage about, what the terms of references there are, uh, and how different uh, constituencies can agree on what might count as success uh, from those uh, discussions. And obviously, the point being that not everybody's going to agree that the, those success stories will be the same, but that's fine. Uh, and then my third point is how could should this constituent engage? So this comes down to the hermeneutical injustice. Uh, so when, how often will the constituencies be involved? How can they share and uh, develop equitable processes of engagement? So this obviously focuses particularly on the question of fairness. Are the processes fair? So there are obviously other questions that need to be considered, but I argue these three are really fundamental to upstream planning for planning engagement, uh, and they have the potential, if we get them right, to promote a more inclusive and fair process of engagement. So just to finish, I just want to make two uh, little provocations uh, to end uh, my contribution to the panel uh, in the form of questions. Uh, so I'm following pretty much the same pattern of the uh, previous two speakers. We've obviously got a good pattern here. Uh, so the first one, is whether astrobiology uh, research and innovation is a special case. Uh, is it different in the context of inclusion, fairness, engagement, or is it just a different case? So from my understanding of the issues, it would appear to be mainly a different case with one or two exceptions, then obviously I'd be happy to discuss that when we get into the conversation afterwards. The crucial thing there is what can we learn from other examples of engagement uh, with new and established areas of research and innovation that help, could help to inform inclusive and equitable forms of engagement. So in that context, I note that we are in the midst of COP26, obviously, do you know what I mean? So when we start talking about how do you engage across uh, multiple countries, there are processes, imperfect as they are, that can, uh, can offer us some solutions. Uh, and then my second question right, relates to some of the issues raised by Timiabi in an excellent talk. Uh, it's particularly taken by your phrase, version control problem. Uh, to me, because uh, that really struck me when I was looking at your abstract before uh, before we talk. So I argue Timmy A.B. makes a very convincing case that we have passed through phases of development uh, in relation to space research and innovation from 1.2 to 2.0, obviously uh, to 4.0, and then further still uh, that Timmy A.B. was arguing for the potential of emerging space era of 5.0, uh, which is more inclusive and fairer. So those arguments, I argue, are persuasive. Um, I'd certainly sign up to them. But the two questions I have are relating to that is who do we need to convince to embed those practices of inclusion and fairness in the context of engaged research uh, and innovation? And then crucially, uh, which is probably a point actually as much to do with some of Emily's points as well, do different constituencies have that shared understanding 
of the issues that were raised through stages one to four. So do we actually understand where we are now and where we've got to to get here? Thanks very much, Rick. Um, I think Linda, you and I both know the question of who is absolutely crucial. And I, I think part of the reason I planned the, this panel responses in this direction is because the final one, Andrea, I think is probably going to address questions of how. So I'll hand over to Andrea. Thank you, Anne. So as an environmental scientist, the first thing I would like to say is how incredibly grateful I am to critical thinkers like Timia B, Emily, Rick and Alessandra Marino for, for pushing me for, for questioning my practice, especially because uh, remote sensing of our, uh, Earth observations, drones are what I live and, live and breathe in, 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 my, in my work as an academic in the last 30 years. And my work is specifically focused on indigenous communities and their territories. Now, indigenous communities, they um, control and manage about a quarter of the world's uh, terrestrial surface area. And they uh, protect about 40% of uh, protected areas and, and areas of high ecological value, right? But, and it's a miracle actually, that they are still present in these places after centuries of genocide, slavery, displacement, dispossession, and now even being confronted by um, indirect environmental impacts like climate change, right? But there has been a movement of empowerment, of sovereignty, and the big breakthrough was the 2007 UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And, and there, there, this idea of free prior and informed consent was formed, that if you're going to go into an Indigenous territory, you first have to explain what you're going to do and how you're going to collect the data and how this data is going to be analysed and who is it going to benefit. Now, the big question that uh, Timiebi, Emily, and Rick and Ale are asking is, well, space technologies changes their rules of the game here, right? That historically, you had to physically enter an, indig an indigenous territory. Now, my position is that I bring, as, as a white male, not only the, the male gaze, but as a white male, uh, in a space scientist, I bring in the space technology gaze into indigenous territories. I can now, at a click of a few buttons, access remote sensing imagery, freely available, analyze the data, and I no longer have to enter indigenous territories to extract data out of indigenous people. And in, in my indigenous colleagues are shocked when I WhatsApp them and said, well, you had a fire on your territory two days ago and it burnt 50 acres or, you know, um, what went on there? They were shocked because just five years ago, 10 years ago, you actually had to enter into their territory and ask them for permission to collect this data. And they knew exactly, you know, how this data was to be collected and analyzed and publicized. So space, space technologies now raise the very real specter of a new era of coloni colonization of indigenous territories. You know, what uh, you, Timiebi, said, you know, it's, we're confronting issues of coloniality and equity and a void uh, in law and policy. Now, there is a void in law and policy. Free prior and informed consent is only relevant if you enter territories. We need new laws and new policies to say, well, if you're going to extract uh, space data of indigenous territories, what say do indigenous people have in this? How this data is used? So we're, we're now confronted with, you know, control over and how this data is to be used on indigenous territories, how it's generated, who decides what kind of uh, sensors are trained on indigenous territories, how it's analyzed, how it's documented, how it's disseminated. 
and and so we we need a new year of thinking on space data consent use ownership and storage and so this is almost like a a question back to all these amazing amazing critical thinkers that me as a natural and, and environmental scientist i i require some some you know <laughs> new ideas new new um approaches to confront this very real challenge that is now presenting a new era of dispossession and neocolonialism within indigenous territories. Thank you, Andrea. I think that's a very powerful thought, that reminder that space exploration is not just about the going out, but also about the taking in. So thank you very much. Thank you to all three of those responses, you know, from very different perspectives, giving us some very interesting things to think about. And as I said at the beginning, uh, we've now got some time for questions and comments and thoughts and opinions. We've got some questions coming in, but I'd encourage you to put more in the Q&A boxes at the bottom of the screen. So if you have a thought, a comment, a question, then please drop it into the Q&A box and, and we'll address it. So I'm going to start with um, a question to um, Timmy Aby, and it comes from Chris Lee. Uh, first of all, Chris, it's great to see you, that you were able to join us. And Chris starts off by saying, good to see you, Timmy Aby. So, <laughs> and he, like, he wanted, could he ask for your thoughts on who should argue for future funding and governance for human space exploration? Uh, should it be just the traditional technology agencies like NASA and ESA? or new space entrepreneurs keen to get on with the job, or should it be like something more like the UN, an organization representing user needs on behalf of all humanity? So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, but obviously any, any of the panelists, if you can join in on that one, but Timmy Aby maybe first. Excellent. Um, so happy to see Chris here. I referred to him because when I first start, started talking about the Space 4.0 and Space 5.0 eras, Chris was the first person to comment that are these really useful labels because you know they they hide a lot of things so and i also follow a lot of chris's work um where he's basically responding to everyone kind of saying are we really having proper conversations here and so i think he really raises a good question because i also got to meet chris you know during the time when he was working with developing countries on the ipp program at the uk space agency and so um i actually learned a lot of stuff from him and in a way i will be quoting him back and saying that you know we need we're at the point now where for a long time space was this you know the apollo and all these big things that they do have this sense of awe and wonder and inspiration but really from the 90s when application started we're really seeing that there are tangible benefits that come from space applications and people still aren't really realizing where all those benefits actually flow down. And so exploration, even though we talk about it being something for everyone, as someone that comes from a developing country, I know there are a lot of pressing and important things on the ground. And when I talk to people, you know, some of the youth, the African youth who are really interested in space, who have grown up with science fiction think yes space exploration is cool we see ourselves you know being able to go to mars and all those things but the majority of people are still going to be wondering how does this actually help us do our day-to-day -day living and so i think the message still needs to get out there how space actually helps society on an everyday level and not just the fanciful things about space exploration but at the same time the reason that I, when I speak to developing countries, I say you should be taking cognizance of things like space resources and space settlements discussion, is that what we've seen from history is that if you're not there in the formative stages of change, if you're not part of the governance discussions before things start, you will never be included in that conversation when it actually becomes important. So right now, maybe water on the moon is not something Botswana cares about. But soon, 
when we actually do have colony, you know, when we do have sites on the moon and when people are, you know, going to space on a regular basis, it's going to be very hard for Botswana to say that they should get a seat at the table then. Because what we saw in the United Nations in the development of the space law regime was it started off with just 24 countries that were negotiating those in original space law agreements. But of course, it was a bilateral arrangement between the US and USSR because they were the only entities that can actually operationalize this. And, you know, to go to Andrea's question about, you know, how did, you know, how, how, how do indigenous perspectives feel and a, a whole bunch of people at the time were really scared when they found out this earth observation technology, you know, happened and you have the remote sensing principles that came out, I think, in the 1980s, where they tried to balance should you have permission, and of course the international community always agrees that, you know, space is not a place that has sovereignty. And so anyone can go there and it's kind of like, well, you can go there. We're not stopping you. But of course, you don't have the capacity and the technology. So you're stopped by your own means. So that's a long, really long winded way of saying at this point, me staying in America, I think that even in America, it's hard to get everyone to think that space exploration is a priority. So the first court of order is really getting people to understand what does space do for you as a critical infrastructure like what does gps do earth observation remote um you know satellite communications how does that benefit you and even then we have all these challenges of equity within those space applications talk less of going to the moon and mars Thank, thanks to i mean i think i suspect both emily and andrea have got something to say that i can see andrea thinking i can from the concept from the perspective of you know an indigenous community at, at a relatively small scale, and, and I can see Emily and Rick, as well, he's waving at me. Uh, Emily, um, you know that this notion of, of the relationship of, of society and space. So um, Rick waved. So would you like to drop in first, Rick, and then maybe Andrea and, and Emily will add in later. <sighs> yeah, I, it's 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 a cracking question, and, and thanks also to Amy for a fabulous answer. I, th I think some of this is down to anticipation. So the, the, if you compare the two, the two examples of human exploration and, and Andrea's really powerful example of Earth observation and what that means for people who are suddenly being told uh, what they've experienced, yeah, uh, the fire, for example. Um, there's a question about when we have these conversations, yeah? When do we have the engagement, yeah? And, and the Earth observation thing, people have seen that coming for a while. I mean, so what, why was the conversation not had earlier, yeah? Uh, so we tend to focus on the sexy stuff. Oh, human exploration, that's sexy. Yeah, let's talk about sex. Let's talk about human exploration because that's a really groovy thing. We can have all those lovely examples of Star Trek and slash fishing uh, to refer to it. But then there's real practical, ethical consequences of things like oath observation. Um, so the issue then is why was that not anticipated um, and why could that have not been looked at before? So that is possible, do you know what I mean? And then there are questions around... Um, and this is why I refer to other examples from from a kind of science site today about precaution. Yeah, so that there are there are well established principles around precaution that could have been applied in that context um, before you then implement those pieces of technology. So my pr very practical uh, response to that would be to say, okay, should we have a standing panel? Yeah, some kind of standing citizen assembly, uh, which takes into account an international dimension and explores in an anticipated way uh, the types of issues we're discussing today. That would be my kind of, that would be my suggestion. Uh, and that, that panel could take into account issues of representation. It could take into account issues of utilities so the types of expertise and experience that people uh, bring to it. And it could also have a kind of emerging perspective in terms of allowing people to bring in contributions. So that, that would be my suggestion. Why don't we have a standing panel uh, that's, that allows us to have these conversations in advance, but also take account of things that are happening in real time. Thanks, Rick. Andrea, Emily, do you want to add anything? Andrea. I'd be very keen for Emily to interject. <laughs> and, and, and then I'll, I'll see how I can sweep up the comments from maybe Rick and, and Emily. To okay, Emily. <laughs> Let's try, Andrea. Um, I'm afraid, so I'm glad Rick went practical and I'm glad to maybe covered space content because I'm going ideology. Um, and I'm thinking about different paradigms of social justice from political philosophy. 
And I think what's so difficult and at the, seems to me inevitably at the core of so much of these questions about international agreements, legal positions, um, you know, declarations of different forms and what that means is um, we're, we're at that slightly difficult point where so many legal frameworks still work through the um, the idea of redistributive social justice. So how much of a pie could people have? Um, and these have well-known critiques about their, their universalizing um, tendencies and how that often can reproduce hegemonic um, normative values. And on the other side of that, the, the relational paradigm of social justice and political philosophy is quite hard sometimes to play out into these kinds of settings. So, you know, if people have very different needs and assets and affordances in these spaces, which I think Andrea's example speaks to beautifully, taking those into account is necessarily far more complex than a redistributive model. And then lovely people like Nancy Fraser will suggest quite sensibly that, of course, there's a dual model to be had here. These are not um, op oppositional perspectives and that social justice requires both redistributive and relational um, perspectives from political philosophy when we try to think about where rights sit, where needs and assets sit, who has voice, who doesn't, and what that does. What I think is really hard to do is distill that um, into something really tangible as people who have kept up with any of my work around equity and inclusion and science and public, you know, have spent, I think, 16 years now trying to distill that into a framework and all the frameworks are hard, all the frameworks are difficult. Um, and in the context that I work in, I come back again and again to this question of context, because what the kinds of political languages and concerns and framings and sociocultural political histories of one context are often so radically different to that of the next context. And that can be true of, of people also over time, um, as well as nation states. And so to weave together, and this is where I think hats off to Timmy Abey, I mean, to weave together that level of complexity, and of course, I absolutely agree, complex systems at the international level for technologies and space applications and research that both is kind of on earth and beyond. I mean, it's, it's just incredibly complicated and I'm not sure I have a good practical solution. <laughs> Thanks. Andrea, did you want to? Yes. Um, so Timmy, you, you talked about um, having people on the table and I think that's absolutely fundamental. And uh, the big issue is the problem of digital divide you know especially when you talk about uh, space data and the terabytes that are involved how how do you have indigenous community members at the table where where they can't even access the data that is about their territories and and truthfully engage in in a dialogue about this this data so i think there's there's almost like some baseline issues that have to be addressed. And Emily, your, your point about culture and, you know, representation, it's, I think that is also really fundamental, you know, the, the, the indigenous space scientist, you know, how it, that's unexistent, really. I think there, there are three or four people that I can think of that can fit into that category. But having these individuals being represented in, in on a cultural platform, you know, to, to show that these things are possible, they they exist. Um, so th there's a lot of work on uh, practical matters, but also on on cultural matters, on role models, and representing indigenous people actively involved in the space sciences um, publicly and and you know in, in cultural artifacts I think is really really fundamental actually there's yeah. a, there's a, sorry before I'm going to, there's a question I'm going to bring in a question here in fact I'm going to combine a couple of questions one from Raquel Veljo and one from Carla and Raquel says if any of you would like to speak a little on the question of astronomy from the ground, such as observatories, but she also specifically mentioned the various concerns of those who benefit from those facilities and the intersectional concerns related to spaces like the Mauna Kea Observatory. 
And then Kala is also speaking about the concern about the International Radio Telescope in South Africa because of Africa's, African scientists being visionary for Africa's future in science, which I think brings in some of the points we were making. But I interrupted you, Timmy Abe, you were about to um, speak. Yeah, I was going to say, I know there are so many questions, but I just had to jump on the end of what Andrea was saying, because obviously right now COP26 is going on in Glasgow. And I was at COP two years ago in Germany. And when they developed the indigenous platform, so for years, obviously, indigenous people have been saying, we need to be part of this. So I was in the room when they were negotiating an indigenous platform, but it was fantastic and amazing to go into the other rooms, like the room of the scientists and hear their response to indigenous science, because they were kind of like putting in words, you know, legalese, like we will take into consideration indigenous perspectives and other perspectives where necessary as applicable, all these phrases. And so it's very interesting that when you create these seats at the table, yes, you can have one room saying we should have an indigenous platform, but, and I guess it's like when we talk about sustainability and we say there's a sustainability officer, but you actually need sustainability within all your practices. So it's not just about having a platform for indigenous people and saying, there you go, you've got a platform. And then you go into the scientist room and then basically people are saying, we'll think about it when we want to. Well, that's already the status quo, right? So, you know, it's very, and you know, two years later, I don't know what's really come out of the indigenous platform. And I was in Dubai for the Dubai Expo two weeks ago. And basically in my panel, we had some indigenous people there working on space programs. And when I put this question to them, they didn't want to answer it about what is the indigenous platform doing? You know, so it's it's interesting. How do we integrate these concerns? And this is why I said, you know, one of my colleagues said, actually, maybe saying the space 5.0 as the ethics era is also you bucketing rather than looking at what were the issues within all the eras and what are the intersections? Is it really like a circle rather than like moving from one end to the other? So how do we integrate all these thoughts into everyday discussion? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask Paul in one question from our colleague Ale, Alessandra Marino, um, who's wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how recent revivals of Afro Afrofuturism and or indigenous futurisms may highlight inclusive practices related to planetary belonging. And I think that, you know, that notion of planetary belonging is something you were starting to address there, I think, to me, Obi. I think I can't, I would love Emily to remind us of that phrase she said, where it was like, um, futurism is the history in the present. Can you remind me of that phrase? Because I think this speaks to it beautifully. And I've got it here. It's um, a future history of the present. So, so for me, I think there is a distinction between Afrofuturism and African futurism. So Afrofuturism is actually US. It's like, it's, it's, it's a US construct and it's about, you know, it's a unique situation. And the reason that there was a distinction that came up was actually because Emily referred to Nnedi Okafo, who is now a faculty at ASU, which is really exciting. Um, you know, she had this distinction because she was kind of like, it's weird because you can't really lump all Black people together. So the African-American experience is very different to the African experience. And so Afrofuturism that really was talking about how do we open up spaces for Black people and space being the place, which is Sun Ra, the most famous Afrofuturism, was really at a time when space wasn't the place. You know, it wasn't the place for inclusion and it wasn't the place for all these actors versus this Afrofuturism, which I think speaks to what Emily just said about it's like it's actually happening. So it's the present. It's like African participation in space. And I think just the fact that, say, the African Union is like establishing an African space agency. The issue that we had with that is that that was a European construct that was brought to Africa because the Europeans were looking for an avenue to be able to spread their Copernicus and GMES data into these spaces. And they saw that when they went to Africa, they didn't know where to go to kind of coordinate. So they started having these discussions. Wouldn't it be great to have an African space program? And so the challenge was that Yes, they ended up taking it up, but now it's kind of like, 
we can't follow history and just take these black box ideas because all it's going to be is a gateway for Western countries to come and exploit us even further. So if we are going to have an African space agency and an African space program, it has to be African led with African ideas. But the problem is how do you conceptualize what does space mean for Africans when we're still grappling with what does actually space do for us? And so that's the challenge that we have in these African countries. And I think things like um, the interesting thing with everything that's going on about planetary protection, like with light pollution from all these satellites is that the interesting thing is they African countries who still have dark skies could be in a good place to kind of lead conversation about where we should be going with all these satellites coming in astronomy and the fact that there are no more dark skies. So I think there are pockets of opportunities for African countries to lead conversation. The space debris issue, because they have all this history of environmental degradation in their environments, the space settlement discussion to be able to talk about the impact of colonialisms and settler mentality. So I think even though it's hard for an African to be like, I can be part of the conversation and contribute. There are pockets of things that we have expertise on from other areas and other experiences that we can bring to the space discussion. Thank you. I'm sorry that we're not going to get around to more of these questions, um, but um, we're, we're running close out towards the end of the session. So I'd just like to invite each of our, of our panelists today just to take a few seconds to give a, a kind of closing remark maybe something you've taken away from today or something, another question you'd like to leave us with as we come towards the end. I think we'll go in reverse order. So Andrea, we'll, st we'll start with you. In, this, in, what few, in a few seconds, what would you like to leave us with? Personally, I'm just immensely grateful for the continuing challenging of, of my practice. Uh, I, I have to admit, I started my career as a very neo-colonial white male savior with, within indigenous communities and it is individuals like Timmy, Abby, Emily, Rick and, and Ale that have helped me transform my practice. So, you know, it's more strength to your work and, you know, I, I think it, it is having an impact as demonstrated with my practice and please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Rick, what about you? I think I'll, I'll end where I started my career, which is <laughs> academically, do you know what I mean? Which is, which is around, uh, I started my research career around cloning. Um, and at the time, uh, uh, obviously cloning of Dolly the sheep back in, uh, back in the late 90s, there was a global outcry, yeah? A global outcry um, about how science, had, science and technology had run too fast ahead and there hadn't been enough engagement. Um, and it occurs to me that, I mean, because of the kind of discourse of progress, unfettered progress that sits around some of this uh, discussion of space, uh, space research and innovation, uh, my, my main concern is if we do not engage and we do not take into account the principles of inclusion and fairness, which we've discussed today, we could easily find ourselves uh, in another situation like that, where we have a really significant backlash uh, against this type of uh, science and technology. Thank you. Thank you. Emily, very quickly. <laughs> very quickly, Anne, if such a thing is possible. Um, I think so conversations like this for me just lead me to handwriting thousands of notes and making so many connections. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure Raquel will um, kind of see this link, but the kind of Lee Vinsel's work on the kind of techno aggrandizement anti-tech hype that you see in STS sometimes, all of the implications for doing engagement work, whether that's responsible research and innovation, whether that's other engagement models, what they look like, um, how we balance the local, national and international pressures. Obviously, we haven't, for the first talking two years, none of us have mentioned COVID, but I mean, there, there are other things that require international cooperation. And we, I think I can only imagine with horror, though looking back as, as we already perhaps look now at some of the things that have gone down in COVID at the international level that are horrifying. Um, so how we keep moving in, in ways that don't belie a kind of Whiggish view of this future, um, but do suggest that we can do things that are um, transformational, cooperative, um, 
uh, equal and and equitable in ways that we can figure out you know we can construct this we can make change we can go forward and i think the, the more we think about that the better i'll stop now Anne. thank you <laughs> to maybe a final word from you you're on mute final word from me is to ask rick to type in his question that he had for me in the chat because i think that summed it up really perfectly he said you know who do we need to embed this kind of thinking like who do we need to convince and do different constituencies have the shared understandings of these issues and i think that's th those are really great things to kind of ponder on because it can be great to talk about this but it's like okay where who should be talking about it we can have this conversation here but are we an echo chamber you know who who actually do we need to convince for this and it's also not about convincing but getting people to really understand and getting you know, I said in my abstract, Judith Butler talked about taking account of oneself and recognizing, you know, like Alexand Andrea has done, where you go through this transformation, personal transformation on your own. And so people have to get there. So how do you help people along in that direction? And it can take time. It's not overnight, which is why we have had the different eras. And I just feel like with the Black Lives Movement, with all the social unrest, with COVID, this is really the time to talk about these issues and let's not let this opportunity go amiss. Thank you. Yes, we're, we're getting close to the end, but I'd like to end by thanking all the speakers and all the participants in today's event. And behind the scenes, my colleagues, Hannah and Rachel, who have been pulling the strings for us and making things happen. If anyone has any questions or thoughts that we haven't been able to address today, we're posting an email address in the chat box. The science faculty communication team will make sure your questions and comments are passed on to the right person. We're also, we'd also like your feedback on today's events and you'll find a link popping up in the chat box to give us some feedback quickly on how you've, what you've thought about today. Finally, our word about next week's event, the third in the series of three, which will be on Thursday the 18th of November at 1600 UTC. This final event will explore astro-environmentalism, the prospect of extending concepts of the environment and environmental ethics to outer space. And the link to register for that is coming up in the chat box too. And I'll close by once again thanking our speakers and thank you for joining us today. And from the speakers and from me, goodbye. Thanks everyone.